Uh, my name is Sean Blagsvet. Um, this is the talk on uh, open source AI recipes, not with the undergraduates. Um, and but uh, we're still we've been doing a bunch of stuff with various governments, not necessarily in America. Um, and then you know have a belief of you know all of if we can turn all of this work into really open source assets, that that is good for the world. And hopefully, I'll convince you by the end of this that that's true. Um, so today's talk is going to be about, you know, the normal stuff that I feel like we're all into right now, which is the terrifying, amazing future, a little story of farm bots in the agricultural space, some of the lessons that we think are relevant from open source as it applies to this, and then, you know, what we think then is the implied strategy and architecture, and then finally a call for us to share. So uh, that's the flow, and we'll get into it. Um, before we start, you, you know, everybody wants to know who the hell is this person talking to them. My name is Sean. Um, I grew up in California. I spent many years uh, at Microsoft as, you know, in, as a PM in Office and Windows. I then moved out to India in 2004 as the third guy that started the Microsoft Research Lab in India. Um, after three, and then, you know, I got like the patent in machine translation and instant messaging back in 2004. I've been very into essentially, you know, chat versus earlier SMS as the metaphor, which has been dominant in India for a really long time. Uh, I then had a job site focused on informal sector labor for 11 years that became the largest one in India, uh, about 10 million users. Uh, and then, you know, did some other stints at Adara um, and Marco Polo, he did a little bit of the internet policy space at the White House. Um, and so that's me as the background. And so, you know, but in terms of where we are now, we have this belief that obviously every organization and every thinking job is going to use AI. These things are explosive. I don't have to tell you this. Um, and then, you know, but the part that, you know, is an often repeated refrain, which is that obviously everybody that's going to use AI will replace everybody that doesn't. Uh, and the stat that really blew my mind that I heard this morning on my favorite podcast, which is AI Explained, if you haven't subscribed to it, was by the end of next year, we think there's going to be a hundred times more compute in the world than there is today. By the end of six months from now, there'll be ten times more compute than there is today. And so, like, there is really this, I feel like we're at the beginning of the acceleration toward this singularity. And that is a weird moment to be in, in technology. Because essentially our belief is all of our jobs as thinking people is going to be that of a prompt writer or an API stitcher, right? Can we control the, the AIs to basically create useful artifacts on our behalf? And probably the way that we differentiate ourselves among that is to hook it up into some other API that's not obvious. Be it in our personal data, be it public data, be it another a, a, a API out there. And so if that's the job for most thinking people, then it implies a bunch of different questions that I think everybody's going to have to ask, which is, how do I find what's working in my field? Can I fork that? How do I keep up with all of the other innovations in every other organization and every other worker that's happening? So this discovery piece, I think, matters a lot. Two, there's this constant pace of change, which is every industry is collapsing into this one. If you look at the folks that are trying to figure out where's the next place to do oil drilling, they're building the fine-tuned LLM model that's sort of just like we do next word prediction, they're doing next oil drill prediction. If you look at pharmaceuticals, it's a generative AI problem. If you look at finance, it's a generative AI problem. And so there's this huge collapsing that's happening here, and then you end up with basically tech risk, which is I want to take advantage of the latest stuff from OpenAI, but I'm afraid of Microsoft, and oh, the open source ecosystem also has a bunch of amazing things, and Gemini has a bunch of amazing things. And so there's this question of how do you keep up and build a platform really that is future-proof, such that every innovation that's coming out, in, as all of these fields are collapsing into one, benefits you and benefits the stuff that you're trying to build. And then finally, as you're doing this, as you're sort of constantly swapping out these components, how do you do analysis and evaluation to say, is this change worth making? I think this is going to be the problem of most organizations and most people as, as these fields collapse and there's this sort of constant inheritance of code and AI that we're all building on top of. So, you know, to make this concrete, I'll tell you a story that started at this point 15 months ago of a collaboration that we've been doing uh, with an organization called Digital Green. Digital Green has been operating as an NGO in India and Africa for the last 20 years. Um, and they had an incredible insight 
uh, and it was like it was started by a colleague of mine out of Microsoft Research India back in 2005, um, and they had this incredible insight, which is if you can film farmers telling them basically explaining what they figured out as best practices in one place. And you literally just film that and package it as a small video and you take that to other adjacent farmers who speak the same language and are growing the same crops 10 miles away. It is the most effective way that they've ever discovered to convince a farmer to change their behavior, right? More effective than any other government expert coming in and saying you should do this, this, and this. So they've done this for the last 20 years. They've got 100 million YouTube hits. They have 10,000 videos. And so, and, and they've scaled, right? They've received five large, you know, Gates Foundation grants. They have 400 people. They're a big organization. They work with 10 different states in India, the government of Nigeria, the government of Ethiopia. And so we came together late last year and we said, hey, you've got thousands of these fact sheets, these videos, this accumulated wisdom. Can we basically make this truly accessible to extension agents? Extension agents, you could think of them as mentors for farmers. And the goal there was, could we build a WhatsApp bot, right, that gives you vetted data, right, that gives those farmers, when they ask a question, that gives them vetted data that's editable by those experts, so it's not a hallucination. It's not what GPT-4 thinks is the right way to grow chili, which is mostly based on U.S. documents and constantly confuses the word chili with the word capsicum, which in Indic languages is two totally different words, but in the, you know, lexicon of the biases of GPT-4 are actually the same thing. So you have to tease those apart. So you really want to basically use on their data, the stuff that they've collected. Can we do that with simplified links and citations? Can we do that in most Indic languages so that people can actually speak to it in local languages there and then get a piece back? And then more recently, can you also diagnose crop issues so basically people can take a picture and you know, ultimately determine, hey, uh, what's wrong with my plant and how do I fix it? Um, so we demoed this with Digital Green at the UN uh, last April as part of the science panel there. And then to give you a sense of kind of like how does it work, right, you basically you ask a question in text, we basically run it through, uh, and you'll see in a second, like ASR, it does a rag lookup, you get an answer, it can do, you know, we've also like basically hooked in the uh, speech trans uh, transcription and then translation in multiple languages, and then you get an answer back and you get citations. That's it. This is the rag demo hooked up into WhatsApp. Um, and then more recently, GPTV came out and Gemini came out, and so boom, you can do some plant diagnosis as well. If you want to go play with those directly, you can scan those. I'll, I'll show you all the links at the end. And so the impact of this was pretty good, right? We've had 1,500 users, there's 35,000 messages exchanged, uh, there's you know, large-scale reinvestment that's happening, this is being expanded with a program called Vistar at a national level across India. You know, the, the, also the anecdotal feedback was really fun, that people felt more confident, the fact that they could ask questions in their own language related to their livelihoods, right? And then do that in a way that wasn't, uh, f like that basically allowed them to save face Right? As in, it's embarrassing sometimes to ask questions to your colleagues or others. And so the fact that they could do that with a bot right, uh, w was really nice. And so this is great. Now, there's this part that, you know, obviously, I don't know how many of you have built right, these LLM bots, or these rag bots. You know, but, you know, you think like, okay, you know, if we go back to it of like Digital Green had a bunch of documents. And, if, and then on the other side, you want WhatsApp. And so if you think like, how do we think this should work? It's like, well, you would put all of that into like a vector database via RAG, right? And then you run some speech recognition stuff and you ask it into the knowledge base. And then, you know, you basically summarize those results. This is the, the RAG pattern. And then, uh, um, you know, you, you summarize those back and then you do text to speech and you send it back. Great. But, you know, if you build these things in practice, shit goes wrong. Right? And so, you know, the stuff that goes wrong is, well, speech recognition doesn't actually work for most low resource languages. Bojpuri, Malawi, Twi, Chichwa, right? And so how do you solve that problem? Well, so to do that, we have to build out our own A100 cluster, run open source fine tune models out there, run that on enough GPU, which, you know, six months ago was $10,000 a month, now it's only $2,500 a month, so you can get real time interactions and get an actual response back in under five seconds. 
All right, and then ideally, you also want to basically swap out so you have all of the best private models. So when Whisper 3 comes out, like that one's pretty good at some of them. The Chirp GPU mo or the Chirp model from Google's are also good. But you're always basically stuck with how do I run all the open source models, but also run the best of these to actually get this to work. Then you have to use different models for the long audio versus short model, of course, right? Video transcripts, given that we've got a database of a thousand videos, actually suck inside of vector DBs. So you have to do a whole synthetic data pipeline around that. Then DB, vector DBs like long, short text. And so if you look at, like we suck in guidance from the Ministry of Agriculture in English written three years ago from multiple countries. Well, those aren't well-formatted markdown, right? These are dirty, dirty PDFs with complicated tables written by not necessarily the best user experience designers. And so how do you basically get the AI to actually understand the content of those is hard. And you, you know, from our perspective, we used every OCR AI piece that we could. We then did a synthetic data pipeline on top of that. We then put all of that into Google Sheets such that the local teams could edit it to basically figure out that data as well. And, and you have to do that, otherwise you're gonna get garbage. Then, you know, oh, users don't ask questions, right, like the answer. So again, you need a synthetic data pipeline that's there. You know, they like, they dislike those tables. They have every weird document you could possibly imagine. So you need to basically have support for sucking all of those in. And then, you know, again, you know, there's a piece, how do you, normal people update this? We needed a way to basically suck directly from, you know, the, the knowledge level experts. They're used to Google Docs. And so we need to basically pull that in. Um, Vector DBs are terrible, right, at follow-up questions, so you have to have your own kind of summarization piece that's running in front of all of these parts. They can't handle keywords and weird phrases, so again, we have to basically make our own keyword parsers that is mixed with the DB. Um, then, oh, by the way, speed matters tremendously. If you take two minutes to give somebody an answer, they don't use the product, right? And so to basically make that happen, you have to invest in these, like we do just-in-time Vespa DB indexes for every document that you can run in our system, plus we support streaming to all of the popular apps. So, and then, you know, obviously figuring out where the hell a bug is is really hard, so because there's so many levels here, it's, it's difficult, so you need observability there. You need a basically a feedback system that you build in with like up and down piece, and you need meta-analysis to say, great, what types of questions are we answering well? Are the ones around pests, can we answer well? What about the ones around Chile in this particular region? Do we have a failure there? So you have to have this sense of, where am I doing things well versus not? And you need that built in as well. And then finally, you also, at the end of this, you need this sense of like, well, I just made a change. Is it any better? And so you need an evaluation framework. So that's a long way of saying like, there's a lot of work. This is a year and a half of work, right? And so the way that it actually works obviously is way more complicated than that initial one. And so the question that we though had is like, well, what is it if we're gonna make our own work truly reusable and future-proof, how do we do that, right? And so then there's lessons that I think that are relevant from the open source world that are, you know, that, that we've tried to incorporate and that I think are really relevant, which is if I think about, you know, the innovations that, or the, the, the interventions that drove innovation, right? It starts going back to like, you know, the Royal Society and publishing of papers, right? And, you know, the fact that the scientific community has had peer-reviewed papers for a really long time. And I feel like open source borrows from that tradition and saying, hey, if I can build on top of your work, this inheritance of what is in our actual knowledge base as a society keeps getting bigger and bigger. And so all the, and, and then, you know, things like view source, things like JS fiddle, feel to us like extensions of that, which are small innovations that allow me to see things like your prompts, right? And allow me to see what was the code that made this interesting thing, can I pull behind the curtain and learn from that, make a small tweak and make that happen. 
that we want to encourage reuse, that we want this to be fun, right? That we want to actually include everybody, not just the people that attend scale and, you know, white dudes from America, but the broader sense of folks that don't speak English well and exist everywhere across the world. And then finally, this belief that we must keep abstracting, that in the abstraction we get productivity enhancements, which again is our sort of humanitarian inheritance. So, all of that has led us to GUI, right? And so GUI is essentially what we aim to be is this sort of Pinterest plus GitHub of these AI recipes. And I'll, I'll sort of show you what I mean. And so our purpose is to say, well, how do we enhance the innovation infrastructure? And, you know, the first part of that is we think it's really important that if we want to, like, if all of these fields, if, if every significant field is trying to make a better LLM every day and trying to make a better, you know, 11 labs lip sync model every day. How do you get the advantage of all of them? And so the idea is like, well, what does it mean to attempt to commoditize them? And so at our level, we have an abstraction where every LLM is hot swappable and comparable. Every vector DB is hot swappable and comparable. Every speech recognition piece. And, and I'll show you a little demo of like what that means. And so if I go here, you know, I'll make this a little big. Like, this is just one of our recipes, which is the LLM one, which is almost basically the simplest. And what does it do? It just takes a prompt, right, which was, in terms of coolness, what are the top five car brands sold in America? And it's really interesting to look at this, because I'm taking the same prompt and I'm asking Llama, Gemini, and GPT-4 Turbo, and they have real embedded opinions about which is the coolest car. And the thing that's amazing about that is those opinions are going to affect every document you make in Word and PowerPoint for the next 10 years, right? And so if you're a marketer in the audience, you care about what opinions and biases these guys have because those are real. And so I feel like we've spent a lot of time and it's very justified thinking about the biases around race, identity that all of these LLMs have. Well, they have biases about everything based on the training data that they've given. So this allows you to see it. And so this is, you know, the simplest recipe that exists on our site. And then you can go and see examples of everybody else in terms of how they're running it. Um, you, you can see literally how Farmer Chat churns conversations into structured data. That's one of the examples that's there. Um, and then, you know, everything that you see here is then exposed as just a REST endpoint. Every change you make is then exposed as a REST endpoint. So anything you see here, you can say, great, I want to play with this and I want to pull it on my own app. You can. So uh, to get back to here, so, you know, and then we do the same thing, right, for speech recognition models. We do the same thing for all, all of these other parts. So to keep going, um, and so, you know, uh, and then the second part is that, you know, we want to basically abstract these things into these AI recipes. So in this sense, like, okay, there's the basic LLM, but then there's a bunch of normal things that you would want to do, like hook it up to search SERP. Hook it up the ability to incorporate any document. Hook it up to, so that you can suck in any YouTube URL. And so, you know, again, if you want to take a look at that, right, those are just recipes. So here is a simple recipe that takes a search query, uses essentially, all, gets all of the related terms for that search query, and then builds the answer for them. And so we did this with a client. We added this to 10,000 of their pages, right? This is the number 15 wiki site in America. And then uh, essentially from that, you know, showed that there was a 7% boost in session times when you actually end up answering the zeitgeisty questions that people have about any particular topic. So this is just a recipe that does that for somebody. And it's one of the sort of primitive data pieces that we've got. Um, you know, there's another one, which is you can obviously search any document with the LLM of your choice. And this incorporates and sort of wraps Langchain on top of that. But then on top of this, what we're trying to do is to say, well, there's a social network and sharing part that matters a lot. So if you come here, and I'll go up here, if you go to essentially our explore page, you can come and you can see all of these recipes that we have built and others have built. Um, and then, you know, if you want to see, great, what's this QR code generator thing? And again, this is just wrapping this little recipe, uh, which is, you know, essentially taking a, some control net pieces and putting them together to make a URL. But I can see all the examples of that. And if I like the work that Alex has done, I can see all of his examples and I can see the prompts behind them, right? 
And so this strategy has been pretty good thus far. We have 300,000 people that have run these things on top of our site. We've got, I, at this point, I think we just passed 2 million workflows. We rank in the top three for AI animation, for AI QR codes, for AI lip sync, right? It's, this is the sharing infrastructure by people making these recipes and then getting them out and then other people being able to immediately go ahead and fork them. You get this innovation piece that goes across it. So, the other part, you know, is, you know, going back to our farmer chat example, is, you know, finally we get into then inspectable bots, right? And so this is farmer chat, and like there's a website around it that's up here. Uh, I'll make this a little bigger so you can see it. And so this describes the project, and it's in five different languages, right? And, you know, here's the little talk that, you know, Rick and gave, uh, who's the CEO of Digital Green at uh, the UN. But the, for me, the, and then, you know, you can talk with it here if you want to ask questions, and there's a little UI part. But for me, the part that's most interesting is if you go down and you say tweak the workflow, this is the actual workflow that drives that product. This is the instruction set that's on top of it. This is the particular AI model that they're using, and you can swap that. This is the particular set of documents that they have trained that is their RAG database. This is the speech provider and the voice that they use when they give back an audio response to it. And then we just answered this, which is, and then, you know, if you come here, like if you want to run a synthetic data pipeline on any of these things, you can. But, and then this is the embedding model that we used for that particular RAG piece to make that happen too. So most people will not care about this level of settings and just will change like the high level instruction prompt and essentially the documents. But if you want to change those things, you can. Um, and then you can literally just come over to the integrations tab and then say, hey, I want to connect this to my own WhatsApp number, or I want to connect this to my own API, or embed it as a widget, uh, whatever that is. And so, you know, the part for us that's exciting is, uh, you know, this happens, right? And then, you know, this is an example literally of us. So we did this first in, um, in Telangana, which is a state in India, and then we extended that basically into Ethiopia and with, with Digital Green, and then we've extended into, into Kenya. And literally with each place that we're going, we're just taking in a call center document of all the questions farmers have asked and the Ministry of Agriculture guidelines. And then the fact that suddenly, you know, there's good ASR models, speech recognition models that work for Swahili and then do Swahili accents back. This farmer, right, has used WhatsApp maybe 10 times, and suddenly he's taking a picture of something wrong with his coffee crop, asking that thing, asking basically questions via very shitty internet connections over audio and WhatsApp, and getting back answers that are relevant to his livelihood. So this is an exciting thing, and this is one of these things like, oh yeah, GPTV shipped what, four months ago? And it's not just productivity gains at the level of programmers that we're beginning to see. It's going to affect everyone because suddenly the original promise of Google, which is the world's information accessible to everyone, suddenly gets to be true, right? Especially when it talks about kind of the domains that people work in. So this is exciting. Um, and then the part that, you know, we weren't the only ones to notice. So, you know, The Guardian wrote a piece about this. And then, you know, to sort of see how this is coming out, Opportunity is another uh, NGO, very large one. They get 100 million, I think. I don't know the actual number. A lot of money from USAID, right? And then basically, they're like, we have similar problems in terms of enhancing farmer productivity in Malawi. Uh, can we make this work there? And we said, sure. It's just a matter of swapping the documents. And so this is what I mean by these shared AI recipes actually turning into assets that then spread for folks trying to do interventions in most AI-related industries, which is almost all of them. And then we're doing the same bit, right, for another client who's like one of the biggest HVAC PE firms in America. And so what they're trying to do is basically gobble up lots of like, you know, uh, furnace repair shops. And their goal is to say, hey, we've got a thousand manuals about every AC ever sold in America in every furnace. Can we make the oracle of wisdom that knows everything about that? And so, you know, we've worked with them, uh, again, for the last eight months to basically use these same recipes, use the same core technology, and basically build that. The MPS on that right now is around 50. Not bad. Uh, and then, you know, we're doing other things, uh, 
you're basically that also incorporating vision that allows you to basically fill out forms just by sort of taking pictures of what you're doing. So the last bit of this, and, and I think this is the sort of mental change that we will make for many of our jobs, is if you want to take advantage of all of the latest things, and those are all coming out each week, you need an evaluation infrastructure to know is the change worth doing. And so the last sort of leg of this is this sort of, you know, an eval framework that's built in to sort of raise all boats. And so what you can do here and, and is uh, if I look back at that Ugazi, which was the you know, folks at Opportunity that took the farmer chat piece, like we've got in a built-in you know, kind of analytics framework that's telling you things like not just how many messages came in, but how many pieces of positive versus negative feedback were coming in, how many of questions do we think we answered this appropriately or inappropriately, what was the categorization of those things. So again, th that's built in. And then you know, the part that's probably most exciting uh, at kind of a higher level is, is some work that we're doing um, with the Aikstep Foundation and People Plus AI and MSR India, which is basically to say, great, for low resource languages, we want to set up essentially the comparison infrastructure. So we're using the same infrastructure that we use to compare bots to say, if you come in this particular case with a set of audio files, and so these are audio files in Canada, which is a local language of India, and here's the translation into English of them. And we've done that by a human being. And we call this our golden questions and answers, right? So you can come with your own Excel sheet of your golden questions and answers. And then we basically say, okay, we're now gonna compare the top speech recognition and translation models in this pipeline to see how close does it actually get to what we consider the golden answer. And so what this allows us to do is it allows us to say, great, with each new release that's coming out, we can reevaluate for a very use case specific data set to then say, this one's the best for you. And so this is a different way to think about what evaluation is. It almost doesn't matter that Claude 2 is better at organic chemistry or Claude 3 is better at organic chemistry than GPT-4. For most organizations and people, you want to know if you make this change over here, is it better on my data set? Is it better on the stuff that I care about? And then I don't know if that's a model issue or a prompt issue or a vector issue or any of the things that we described that really make up this pipeline. I just want to know if it's better in the end. And so this is essentially the evaluation framework that allows you to do that, where you can bring your own sort of golden question and answer piece, and then we do this evaluation at the same time. Um, so those are like the main points, right? And, and I feel like I'll end here, which is as we go forward, we think this should actually be an entirely open source ecosystem it, it, such that you could run any of these different models in anything that we do in the cloud. But if you want to run that entirely on your own infrastructure, you can. And that if this is true, then I feel like this begins like, the open source analytics community needs a real answer to what AI is right now, and I feel like this can begin to be that, which is we need a superset. We need a superset that allows us to take advantage of all of the latest innovations from OpenAI and everybody else, but also all of the open source innovations. An ideal allows us to run that anywhere. And so we essentially what we want to do is we want to take everything that we have built with GUI in the cloud which has orchestration and has all these paid APIs, and then say, great, we can also run that inside your own data center. You can also make modifications to it. You can also hook in your own fine-tuned models. You can hook in somebody else's. And uh, that's the challenge in front of us. Um, and so if you're interested in any of those things, uh, we need help. Um, and that's the fast presentation. Sorry for talking so fast. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, yeah. Yes. And if you scan this, it goes to my Dara page, and you can just message me uh, if you're interested. Um, if you go to gooey.ai slash blog, you can see this whole open source vision there, too. OK. Hi. Thank you. First, yeah. excellent presentation. Okay. Um, my background, well, right now I work in data, thinking about all the things that vision AI can do, yes. um, especially 
translating, vision, things like that. Yes. But a long time ago, I was in the Peace Corps in Sub-Saharan Africa doing yes. farmer field extension. Yes. And doing the same thing, teaching people with little printouts Correct, there. correct. And so my question is here, and so in this use case, uh -huh. one of the things I think about is um, for people that they're trusting these bots for their livelihoods. Yes. And let's just say what you are applying for, hey, you have powdery min mildew in India, yes. but then in Malawi or in somewhere else in the Senegal, it's different. How do you localize that, that's a data set, but also make sure that, I, I can't remember the, the right word for it, but make sure you're not passing on or appropriately Don't hallucinating educating wrong data, your, giving back wrong data. Yeah. So this is where you have to have a local implementation partner, Perfect. right? We are not in charge of, like if you go back to you know, this original goal of farmer chat, which I think is really important, which is, uh, where to go? Uh, if I can, it's a problem with turning 40, you can't see anymore. Um, that this piece of vetted data, right? Because as I said, even if ChatGPT is trying to do its darndest, it's not actually by default localized. It, it has a distinct bias toward where it got most of its documents. Most of its documents came from US sources. And hence, it will not give advice that's actually appropriate for a particular farmer, let alone get to the next level of stuff like, oh, if the rainfall was this and you're using this fertilizer and you're growing this crop, the, cro the, the guidance actually needs to be entirely different, right? And so, um, in some ways, this is one of the hardest technical problems because you have to incorporate all of this data, research, real-time satellite data, sensor data. Like, ideally, you would take all of that in before giving a piece of advice. And so, you know, my take is the only way to do that is if you have a local partner that's on the ground that acts as a usability piece, that's acting as data vetting, right? Like, because you're right, you can't give people wrong advice when it's about their livelihood. And the history of development is exactly doing that, right? Uh, people might starve. And people starve, and you know, we're telling, you know, we've told people to castrate their cows, right? And, like, this is, you know, the, the history of trying to do these interventions by Western nations and developing nations is frankly terrible, right? Um, and so again, our philosophy is like, we are a middleware provider, and we're trying to give all of the infrastructure to know whether the LLM is doing the right thing, but we have to have an engaged partner that's looking at that categorization, and that's looking at, this is where thumbs up versus down is, that's doing that in a trained sense. Like, we haven't rolled this out that every farmer can go ahead and use it. It's working with local partners to train extension agents who are the mentors who then go ahead and basically make those things happen. Um, but I fully hear you. <laughs> yeah. But how do you vet? You said, for example, you're working with mm -hmm. government ministries. We, we are not. Our, our partners that use us, so Digital Green is a large NGO that does that. Opportunity is a large NGO that does that, right? And there they maintain those relationships. One problem that I see there, a the bit of experience that I yes. had is some of these government agencies, yes. like uh, Agriculture Ministry yes. or so, that they have a bias, yes. which is basically, like in India a few years ago, they had these, the riots about the black laws. Yes. Basically, the question is who owns the land and who can Yes, I mean, these are political considerations. what they grow. Right. And so, that these government agencies have an influence on that. Yes. And actually not <laughs> doing it for the good of the people. I mean, now you're getting into like the politics that are available there, right? Like the Indian government recently passed a regulation that said that every LLM has to be approved by, you know, that's going to be released has to be approved by them. That is their decision, right? Like the, the Indian government owns India, right? They get to make the rules that exist there. Um, and so uh, from our perspective, we are trying to provide the platform that will allow the analysis and for you to know are you get, what type of answers you're giving. But again, it, you, it's gonna be an implementation partner that's gonna get into the politics of like, what are you recommending versus what are you not? Uh, and that's up to them to decide, right? Yeah, I just see the, the problem that it could lead basically to decisions in the wrong Direction. Yeah, but, but let me be clear, because that happens today, right, in terms of all sorts of loops of, oh, this fertilizer company is creating the results and is really encouraging you to use this particular fertilizer even if it's not the right fertilizer. And, and what I fully imagine is 
it'll probably be the companies that are selling agricultural inputs that'll push this the most, that'll give reasonable advice, but it'll probably be biased, right, to basically encourage you to buy your own stuff. Is that bad? Again, that's gonna be a market-based reaction to see, great, wh what are they gonna do there? They have power and incentive to go ahead and make those things happen. Um, I, I, but again, I feel like I, that is beyond the scope of like they're gonna do what they're gonna do in their own markets, right? And, and that's gonna play out. Um, and we live in that capitalist society, right? So I, I know that may not be the, the greatest answer, but right, as a tech piece, like they can use it if they want to. That is the point of open source in, in many ways. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> this may be stretching it a little yes. bit, but the partner organizations that yes. are here are gonna have uh, competence issues, technology yes. issues, corruption issues. Um, it depends, right? <laughs> yeah, it depends. Yes. I mean, you know, some, yes. some of them on other planets may be non-corrupt. Yes, yes. yes. Um, but the, what is your experience with, you know, without naming any names, huh? with the quality of the partner organizations and their ability to, to perform? I mean, we, we've had really good partner organizations, right, who are, you know, uh, like Bill Gates last March wrote this piece which was, you know, saying, hey, capacity building, right, looks like LLM bots into the future. A bunch of the best funded, best intended organizations globally have paid attention to that. And so we tend to be, and, and their own sophistication in this AI space is over the last nine months has gotten pretty good. But I mean like in Malawi or, or and, you, and then you, you would be you surprised that some... that is then extending in. Like there's, you know, smart program managers inside of the Malawi, you know, government that are looking at these things and saying, this is the direction that we want to go. Um, and so the, the competency piece matters there. What we've tried to do here with things like, you know, our co-pilot recipe is try to demystify what's going on, or is try to say, listen, the part you need to care about is this instruction prompt, your data, your, your, your knowledge corpus, and then these evaluation questions. And then we, in conjunction with that partner, can then iterate to actually make something useful. I meant about your actual experience with these organizations is, in general, what kind of issues did you find with real partner organizations in small countries with very poor economies? So uh, data matters a lot, right? So how you actually, like can you get the correct advice out of the data and the documents that they have provided is no small feat, right? So just getting to the point where is, you know, like, I'll, I'll make it very clear. So like- I, well, you answered the, the, yeah. not the question I asked. Okay. The question I'm asking is, what was your experience? Were they very competent? Did they have, what kind of problems did they actually have uh, when they were trying to release yeah, something at the, like at the level of the organization or at the level of the farmer themselves? At the level of the farmers we're seeing. So uh, the things their, that are coming up the there is they, they really want, the, this photo use case comes up organically among lots of folks. Um, the other issue that is kind of a subtle one is even though we, like, you know, we were interviewing a set of uh, 10 Bhojpuri um, farmers about living about 50 miles outside of Patna, which is the capital uh, uh, city of Bihar. They taught that given where they actually live, they don't have any point in their lives where they're not being overheard, right? Because it's a very crowded, familial environment. Hence, they did not want to use any speech recognition because they didn't want to be overheard. But they were fine doing a sort of mixed, a little bit of English, a little bit of Bhojpuri texting to get answers to their questions. And so that was like a subtle surprise to me. As somebody, I've spent a fair number of years in the like, in tech for development space. But again, you, you sort of say, well, people want to be able to speak in their native tongue, even if they, you know, or their mother language. And so that, that was one. Uh, the other organic case that we see a lot is, uh, is, again, this photo use case. If something's wrong, nobody can tell me, please diagnose this piece. That's come up organically in about 30%. Uh, the other one is women tend to use this a little bit more than men, right? It tends to be used a little bit more at night, right, than, than men. Um, I can forward you kind of the usability findings if you're really interested. Um, I, those are public, and so uh, I'll get that up. And, and that's N of about 200 people in three different states at this point. So. Okay. 
So unfortunately, I came in a little bit late, so maybe I missed this. But I was wondering, um, is GUI AI, is it a nonprofit? Is there a business model? How, yeah, how yeah, we, we are a for-profit uh, right now that are basically making this whole set of stuff. Um, and then, you know, our business model is everybody gets 1,000 credits, right, to come in. And every time you make an API call, you burn credits. And we're spending credits usually somewhere else, right? Like mm -hmm. our open AI bill is $5,000 a month, right? Um, so that's it. You're basically buying credits, and then you're selling them. And then there's a little margin that we have there that keeps the whole thing running. That is the primary the business model. We do, we've done some consulting pieces, but we're moving away from that and just focusing on the main credit-based platform. So if you look here, every time you run a recipe, you spend credits. That allows us to basically purchase those credits across private models and then run it on our own uh, GPU clusters. I see. So are the recipes, um, the recipes can only be used if they're hosted on GUI. Today. So this is the open source transition that we want to make. We want to be able to say, great, you can find some cool thing on the site and then say, I don't want to run that or I want to put in my own keys and then run it on your own site. So basically be able to pull down the orchestration layer so you can run it lo locally is the, that's the place where we want to go. I see. That's very exciting. Thank you. Yeah. No further questions? So again, I'm geeking out on this yeah, totally. Sure. And so you know, my experience is like 10, 15 years ago, that's when 3G was first starting to hit yes. rural farm villages. Yes. Now it looks like 4G, 5G is starting to hit now. In India, not in Africa. Yeah, right. Well, it depends on where you're at. Yeah. But so now we have everything cloud-based. Huh? What do you think the next level is? Because this is super cool, but what is the, what's coming next? Is it edge compute? on people's phones or devices. What do, you, what do you think's next in like ICT for dev or even just for, for this and these use cases? I mean, right Crystal now, Starlink aside, you have to have a local economy be wealthy enough to support a tower, right? We are the, if you don't have that, then you don't have connectivity. And so in the poorest nations around the world, there's just no working towers because there's no power there and you have to have gasoline that's basically running the tower that will again give you infrastructure pieces. This is one of the reasons I love WhatsApp, right? WhatsApp is the greatest low bandwidth tool that actually works really well offline. It still allows you to communicate, I think the world has ever made, right? They, they've whacked the hell out of that. And so like if you have the tiniest 2G connection, it will synchronize all your messages in the lowest bandwidth possible. So. That ubiquity, I think, begins to happen more. And, and then if you talk about the Indian use case, okay, 60% of India is probably now online. It still leaves half a billion people that aren't. Um, per household penetration is probably getting up to be 80%, but it's still in a shared phone environment. I think that gets better, right? I mean, I think everybody, every adult, every kid in the world wants a phone. Eventually, you know, we're making billions of these. You know, the Android handset built three years ago still works pretty well. Um, so, you know, you think about where does this go? I think local language interfaces via WhatsApp, right, is I think where it goes, right? It, for the foreseeable next two years, that's, I think that's gonna be grown like hotcakes. Um, that's kind of my current take. All right, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Questions, last chance. All right. Thank you.